guys, welcome back to the Best Practices Show. My name is Kirk Barrett, and I am your host today. And boy, do I have a treat for you. I've got one of my good friends. And if you're a young dentist thinking, I don't know about the future of dentistry, or you're, you've been out for a while, and you're like, I wonder about the future of dentistry. Well, don't, because you walked into a great profession. I'm going to show you why in just a little bit, so you don't want to miss this at all. Now, if you're joining us for the first time or you're just showing up on a regular basis and you're like, what's this all about? I want to do just a couple things. We had over 38,000 of you join in the COVID conference last year. A lot of you were dentists, a lot of you were dental students. And so if you're here for the first time at the podcast, if you're listening on Spotify, iTunes, wherever, do me a huge favor. You see that button down there that says subscribe? Just click the button because I want to make sure you show up with us every single week. You'll see every single week, I'm going to bring a great influencer, great thinker, great leader in dentistry to give you some great thoughts to help you create a better practice and a better life. So I don't want you to miss out on that. Also, if you haven't joined our private Facebook group, Make sure you join us over there. We're over 13,000 of you joined us, and we're still trying to figure out how that works, but you're going to see it's a great community of people helping each other in the whole process, and you can feel very well connected. And then lastly, if you have your own practice, you're just thinking, gosh, what can I do to just improve my practice, create a better practice, a better life? Join us at Act Dental U. Go to actdental.com and then join Act Dental you and you can see every single week we're going to bring you a great master class with great new thinking you're going to see dr mark hyman is on there as well as some great influencers to help you improve your practice and your life and we're a practice coaching company so if you're just struggling with what to do what do i do next or you just need somebody to talk to about the future pick up the phone give us a call and we'll help you figure it out so i want to introduce my guest today now this great man mark you and i have been friends for a long time and You've been a near and dear friend of mine, and I, I could, I, well, you reminded me of where we met, and uh, it's been years now. And you're one of those guys that's always shown up for me, the community. Last year, you were one of the first people I called when I'm like, I don't know what to do, buddy. Can you help me out? You're like, I'm in. I'm, and then you ask, what are we going to do? And I go, I don't know yet, but hold on to your phone. And I'm sad this week because this has almost been a full year. And we were on the cusp of being together at Hinman. Now, I'm going to do the virtual program. You're going to be down there. I wish I was going with you to see all those guys. And we can't hug yet, but I want people to know who's Dr. Mark Hyman. If, if people don't know who you are, which they've been sleeping under a rock, who are you, man? And what do you do? Kirk, thank you so much. What a joy to be back with a, just a deeply disturbed group of men and women who have really shaped, changed, and saved dentistry. I'm Mark Hyman from Greensboro, North Carolina. And I'm just a guy who, who fixed a few teeth in his career. I got very, very lucky, Kirk. Um, I applied to one college, which was the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. I am a Tar Heel. I got into one dental school, UNC Chapel Hill. I did a two-year oral medicine hospital dental residency in Chapel Hill between residency and dental school. I actually went to Israel, worked as a volunteer dentist for four months. My last week there, I met my wife. So it was an unbelievable time in my life. And then I bought a bankrupt practice in Greensboro, North Carolina, July 1st, 1986, and made it worse. And then I got very, very lucky that some magnificent men and women of dentistry put a whole lot into me. And my practice just exploded and doubled and doubled and doubled and doubled and doubled. And my mentor hero from the UNC Chapel Hill, Professor Ron Strauss, who's the Associate Vice Provost of the University now, was just an unknown assistant professor at the time kept me from quitting dental school during my darkest times. And in 1989, Dr. Strauss said, come back and tell your story, come speak to my students. And I did, and I killed it, it was great. And uh, before you think, well, you and Kirk, you and Marcus, just easy, you're natural speakers. Before I went to, walked into the room to speak, I had diarrhea, I was vomiting, I was nervous. And I got up there and said something and they chuckled and I said something else and a few more people laughed. And I finished to this thunderous ovation. And I, Dr. Strauss came up and said, that was a magic moment you just had. You don't get many of those. And I was like, I don't know what that was, but I want to do that again. So I got very lucky in my career. I had magnificent women that I worked for in my team, magnificent coaches. And we'll talk about some of that as we go forward. But I had 32 years of private practice. Now I'm an adjunct full professor 
and special assistant to the office of the dean at the UNC Adams School of Dentistry. Yeah. So kind of coming full, full circle. I'm a quadruple Tar Heel. I love my school and I love dentistry. It is the greatest profession in the world. So Kirk, thanks for having me again. And I'm just here to help anybody any way that I can. Hey brother, I always enjoy spending time with you. Talk about the realities of being a dentist. Like, you know, dental school's hard. You, you're working with these kids all the time. They get out, they got a lot of debt. They're trying to think about the future. Let's talk about the reality and why this is important. Like you've got to protect your brain as much as possible when you get out in the world. Tell us what you're seeing on the ground when you're talking to these dentists. What'd you experience in the reality of being a dentist? Right. For, for me, what I experienced is I was absolutely clueless in how to run a business, how to hire, how to fire, how to set policies. At UNC Adams School of Dentistry, we have a practice readiness curriculum now. So our students, after four years, know how to write a business plan, read a staff manual, write one, how to read an associate's contract, how to do basic investing in stocks and bonds, um, debt insurance, liability, disability insurance, I had to do a 30, 60, 90 day performance review. I didn't have any of that in school. And now we give our kids all of that. So it's amazing. So our young people are coming out of dental school today, Kirk. They're brilliant. They're absolutely sensational students and they're clueless. Most of them have never hired and fired. Uh, the current COVID D4 students, many of them didn't get a lot of experience this past year in clinic. So they're way under experienced in what you would expect from a fourth year dental student. Financial, for me, again, I went to UNC Chapel Hill. I was very fortunate. My father paid for my schooling. My tuition first semester at UNC back in 1492 was $268. My dental school tuition was 1000 I don't want the young dental students seeing this to vomit. But you know, if they're lucky, an in-state student gets out of school a couple hundred grand in debt now, and the out-of-state kids can be 400000 some of the Northeast schools and other private schools, it can be pushing 750. It's crazy. Um, so there's also the corporate shadow going on. When I came out, you didn't, there weren't corporate dentistry really wasn't a thing. And please hear me, Kirk, corporations per se, I, I'm not anti corporate. I'm anti a non dentist making clinical decisions based on profitability. A word that I use in my seminars every time I speak is appropriate. What's appropriate for your patient at this time in their life. So I don't like some bean counter saying, if you don't do 30 crowns this month, Kirk, you're fired. Right. So some corporations su serve what the young doctors want, which is to sit down and do their dentistry and not deal with the management, leadership, paperwork, taxes, stuff. And I get that. The technologic demands are stunning now for young people that really my generation wasn't as overwhelmed. I graduated December 1983. Dental implants at the time were still pretty much malpractice if you did subperiosteal implants. Uh, braces were train tracks. Pretty much you did amalgam on posterior teeth, big M-O-D-F-L-T-W-A-K-L-M amalgams. You know the type I'm talking about. A little bit of enamel sticking out going, yoo-hoo. Um, back when I started dental school, there wasn't acid etch bonding. So you had concise A and B or adaptic or silicate cements. There was no adhesive dentistry. You just would undercut a tooth and stuff some white tooth colored filling in there, which they all leaked horribly. Um, just as a most basic principle, Kirk, I, I know you've got a gorgeous young family and you've got some graduations coming up soon, I believe. But imagine your senior graduating and not going having a graduation ceremony. So our D4 students are trying to figure out, are they going to get to March for graduation? Are they going to get to hug their favorite faculty person? Are they going to get to be hooded by their fam favorite faculty person? So all of that's on people's minds and you know we're gonna figure this out. Um, I was on a faculty call right before we started today and we had a moment of silence because in North Carolina, the first COVID death was today, a year ago. And I remember at the time, a lot of people saying this isn't real, this isn't a thing and 500,000 souls plus are gone. And it's really been a, a shock to the profession and a shock to the world. So, Blessed memories for any of you who have lost somebody or have an ill family member or friend. I'm just very grateful for where I am career-wise. I love teaching at the school and I love mentoring young dental students and graduates. I've, I've gotten to speak for the American Student Dental Association. I've helped out with the, and at the SNDA. I've helped with the dental school at MUSC, at UAB, um, besides at Carolina. 
and around the country. So for any young person watching, if you need help, if you need a, an hour Zoom for your organization, I'd be pleased to help out for any young people. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Now, I want you to talk because you've had some great perspective. You've had a great career. Talk about the resiliency in dentistry because last year, myself included, you all, we all hit the panic button. This is something we didn't know about. But like you've been through the AIDS scare. You've been through like some of the, the financial downturns. What do you know about dentistry for sure watching all this adversity come at even your career? in this whole process. Right, Kirk, what I know for sure is dentistry will survive and thrive. The concept that the government labeled dentistry and non-essential business is shameful. Shameful us first that we haven't raised enough public awareness of the benefit of optimal care dentistry. That's for another another podcast. But um, again, for my career, I've been through Black Monday 87, the two space shuttles blowing up, 9-11, the stock market crash, you know, the tech bubble crashing, the housing crashing in 08, 09, HIV, hepatitis, H1N1, swine flu, you go through all the list. We're going to get through this with COVID and we're going to thrive. Dentistry knows how to deal with this. Right. And the public just has to see that they're safe in the dental office. So I know the men and women are in dentistry are resilient, Kirk. I also know, I feel like as a profession, many of us got caught with our pants down because we were spending 110% of the money we were making. We weren't fully funding retirement accounts. We weren't putting back money for a rainy day so that we could preserve our teams. So that's been one of the most painful things for COVID for me is, is the pain that dental teams have felt um, to look at your blessed teammates and say, you're, you no longer have a job here. I'm terminating everybody. We're going to get a PPP loan and I'll let you know when we're going to hire you back. I mean, I, I got so lucky, Kirk. I had such a level of love and loyalty for my team. My lead receptionist, Ms. Mary Catherine Ward, was only with me 25 years. My lead dental assistant, who you've had on, Athena Escovedo Calloway. Uh, Tina's been on, uh, was with me for 19 years. I had three hygienists that were with me 15 years. So that, again, they gave me such an unbelievable level of love and loyalty and attention. And, and um, it really helped our practice thrive. Um, you know, what I would say to a young person who is kind of reeling saying, well, what, where do I even start? There's kind of five simple little principles that I would review for anybody. Number one, you got to get the right team and you got to treat them like gold. My dear friend, Dr. Keith Phillips says your patient is always right, right? They just don't have to be your patient. And that's the truth. The patient is not always right. Your team is always right. You always have to protect your team. And I would rather lose a patient family and get a few one-star reviews than lose a valued teammate. And I didn't always feel that way in my career. And that was a mistake. Wait, now, now I want to take each one of these apart. So, so sure. dig a little deeper. Big, you didn't just, you weren't blessed with a great team. No, you, no, no, no. Leader. I and bought my practice July 1st, 86. The receptionist quit six weeks <laughs> later. And the hygienist was a chain smoking woman who hated me. And I dismissed her. I had one employee left. It was a joy. Okay. Okay. Wait, wait, Mark, I'm a young dentist. I totally understand. Like get a great team, but you don't know what I'm dealing with here. Like, yes. I've been there, done that one, man. Wait, tell me more. Tell me. I more. just, I didn't, I'd never hired anybody, Kirk. I'd never fired anybody. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to set raises, how to look at overhead. And that's one reason that I would say to anybody, you have to have a coach. You've got to have someone. You can't just sit, go to Google and figure this stuff out. You spend right. small dollars for a massive return. So I got very lucky, got, I got involved in some really high quality organizations. Um, I first met Miss Linda Miles from Virginia Beach, Virginia. Dr. Gordon Christensen took an interest in me. Erwin Becker from the Panky Institute in Key Biscayne, Florida. My coach and hero, Dr. Kathy Jamison from Jamison Management. I met a follicularly challenged wild man named Kurt Barrett. Um, got, went to Spear Education, got involved with the Dale Carnegie organization studying the material, how to win friends and influence people. So I didn't make this stuff up. A whole lot of people put a whole lot into me. So part of, for me as a leader for your team is not just that you educate yourself, that you share that with the team as well, that you push this on the team, that you reserve training time. Kirk, if you said to me in your 32 years of private practice, I started working in dentistry when I was 19 years old. This summer, I'll be 63. 
I mean, if you said, what's the number one challenge you've seen is that we don't train in dentistry. Our communication generally stinks and we don't train well. We'll buy a $100,000 CAD CAM machine and say, go ahead and use it. And the team is like, use what? I'm afraid to plug the dang thing in. Yeah. So I think if people reserve training time, they'll make their money back 100x. Yeah. Not only training, investing, you take your team. Now, back when we could travel, you'd take them to the courses. Absolutely. You know, some people are like, I don't know. I don't know that I would do that. Like, yeah, you don't. Well, then that's fine. Then you get to work <laughs> for a lot lower level of satisfaction and profitability. Amen. And you'll get a higher level of turnover. I had, again, such a level of love and loyalty, but I paid it forward. I paid the team well. I spoiled them rotten. I took them out for their birthday every year when it's their birthday. Our office Hanukkah Christmas parties were legendary. As a team, we went to Myrtle Beach to the North Carolina State Dental Meeting. We went to Destin, Florida. I took the team to the Hinman in Atlanta. I took them to Las Vegas several times, to San Francisco for the ADA a couple times. We had a dream trip every year that we would take two half days, two half Fridays we'd come in. We'd work our tails off and throw all that money in a kitty. And we would buy nice plane tickets and theater tickets and five-star restaurants. And it just was a joy, Kirk. So people say, oh, my God, well, that cost you a lot of money, didn't it? And the classic answer to that is compared to what? Right. It's estimated, Kirk, and you can answer to this better than I. If you lose one employee every year, it's estimated it costs you an entire year's salary in retraining, advertising costs, 30, 60, 90 day performance reviews, uniforms, pension, profit sharing, 401ks, the whole thing. Am I right? And I think you're absolutely it's, it's right. just nuts. So got to get the right team. You got to build a philosophy. One thing I love about you, Kirk, is how you always speak to your, what your core values principles are of your business. Mm -hmm. And that's something I love. We have a statement of what we stand for at UNC. And I say to our candidates, I'm on the admissions committee and I'll say, you pretty much don't have to ask me a question. <clears throat> Read our statement here, who we are. And if what you're asking me violates that, you already know the answer. And if what you're asking me fits it, you already know my answer too. The answer is of course. Mm -hmm. So got to get the right team. That's paramount. You got to have communication systems, which include a morning huddle. We had weekly team meetings. Um, we had monthly two-hour staff meetings. We had twice a year half-day off-site team meetings. When we worked with Jamison Management, we had Every four months, we had two days of in-office consulting. Every month, we had a leadership call. Every week, we had a marketing call. So I think that's part of the beauty of the high-end consultants in dentistry. With ACT, I'm sure you sculpt it to what's appropriate for the client's needs. Mm -hmm. So working with communications at, at, lunch, at lunch and Learns, we did Lunch and Learns every month, Kirk. We bring in somebody from Philips to show what's new with Sonicare, somebody from from Denmat to see what's new with Snap on Smiles. And we bring somebody in from um, Isolite to see what's new with Isolite, Digidoc, what's new right. with the intraoral cameras. We'd go through all of our manufacturers that we worked with. We bring in our care credit rep, what's new with dental financing, with the onset, the buffering of the local anesthesia. You just go down all the different things that we had that really made us special. I brought the people in to train the team to what's cutting edge. And we did a lot of role playing as well. So let me go back I, to that. So, Mark, please. communication. Like, you, I love when you talk about the huddles and 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 team meetings. And you have to do that. Now, I totally agree. But you get these questions too, Mark. You don't understand. I don't have time for this huddle thing. You know, right. like I got people. I don't have time for these team meetings. And when I do, it's we talk about the same things over and over again. What do you What do you say when people tell you that? I say, I love you. That's lousy leadership. <laughs> you think Michael Jordan just walked on the basketball court and started doing your mama slam dunks. Right. He practiced and practiced and practiced and practiced. And that's how you become world-class. Yeah. I love Malcolm Gladwell. He's got a lot of wonderful books. If you read the book outlier, he talks about how did the Beatles become the Beatles? How did Bill Gates become Bill Gates? And the answer was 10,000 hours of practice. You don't become excellent just by showing up. So our team meetings, our morning huddles were brutally efficient. It's not just a bitching and moaning session. 
our hygienists would just would say, here's my opportunity I see in the day. I don't need them to say, Mrs. Smith is coming in at eight o'clock for a cleaning, Mrs. Jones at nine. You think we can all read, but eight o'clock, Mrs. Smith has a watch on 3031. I see the nine o'clock restorative patient just canceled. Can we get Mrs. Smith to stay? Nine o'clock, Mrs. Jones, chief concern, she wants white teeth for her daughter's wedding, but she broke a tooth, then she went to endo, then she went to get crown lengthening. We never whitened her two teeth. Who can scan her? Who can grab a couple alginates? Who can make the trays? So you plan your day. That's the hygienist, the assistants. What's your roadblocks? 10 o'clock, Dr. Mark is cementing 10 veneers in one room and prepping 10 more in the other. No, he's not. <laughs> you cannot do, you have to look at your doctor only CEO procedures. We booked in 10 minute time increments and you can't double book doctor only time. So if you don't know how to work with block scheduling and efficient and effective scheduling like that, get a consultant to help you. Cheapest money you'll ever spend. And then our business team members would say, here's where we were yesterday. Here's where we are today to our goal, daily goal and number of new patients. Dr. Wonderful has an opening from 10 to 12 tomorrow. Kirk, when I ask an audience who's supposed to fill it, usually somebody says the receptionist. And I'm like, yo mama, it's the whole team. We all go all in. Kirk, on average, my team, added at least $2,000 a day to every day I work, just in stuff, in extra efficiency, in finding opportunities to fill holes. Now, most docs roughly, Kirk, what, they work roughly 200 days a year? According to a lot of statistics published, it's 209 days a year. Okay, let's call it 200 days a year. If listening to me, if working with Kirk, if working with someone in dentistry, you find a hundred bucks a day, that's $20,000 a year right. extra. Just flicking your wrist. hundred bucks is not even a facial pit. If you find two of them, that's 40. If you can only find $500 a day, it's a hundred thousand dollar increase. It's a million dollar change in 10 years. So anybody that says consulting is expensive, my answer is compared to what? Right. If you're so smart, why aren't you doing it yourself? It's because you have other skill sets. So Michael Jordan needed Coach Dean Smith and Coach Phil Jackson to become a national champion and an NBA star. Tiger Woods, God bless him, could have used a driving instructor. Uh, may he heal quickly. Could have yeah. used a different coach, perhaps. Yeah. But coaching is one of the great gifts you will give your team and yourself because everybody needs it. And right. uh, that's easy. So we talk about getting the right team in the right seat, communicating well, education. I talked about Panky. Spear, Coyce, Dawson, Dale Carnegie organization, reading success literatures in office, all those things really help. Technology, I ran through a few of them. Kirk, if I said to a young dentist, if I could say to a young dentist, there's one thing that you must do, it's you buy an intro camera and you take a picture on every patient before, during, and after. Kirk, you've heard me screaming many times. In private practice, I had eight operatories. How many DigiDoc cameras did I have? I think it was nine. I like the way you're thinking. We had one in the men's room too, right? Yeah. Now explain that too, because I think everybody can understand that. And I know that was a pillar in your practice. Like it was, a, it was a, one of the precepts of the practice is we are a visual society. Right. Kirk, for me to say to you, you need a crown because I said so, because you got the distal facial and number two cracked. You say to me, your mama, let me think about it. Why didn't my last dentist tell me about this? Can we watch it? Can we get a pre-denial from Aetna? Uh, let me think about it. Let me talk to my wife, my accountant, my husband, my significant other, because you haven't created this urgency to act. Right. So the, I think one of the worst things we ever did in dentistry was make intro cameras portable. So I just it, it's a false savings because I want a before and a during and an after photo on every patient. The number one rated intro camera is DigiDoc. It's an American company. I know the, the owners, the founders, the CEO, the president. It's a wonderful, it's the Wilson family. They're fantastic. And um, Kirk, if I asked you, do you have your cell phone next to you, bud? I do. Hold it up. So what what is that, A iPhone one or two? Uh it's one of the, yeah, it's, it's, one it's of gotta be a seven or a 10 or something Somewhere. because it's got a better camera. Cause that, oh, yeah. So why would you, it's a false savings to say, well, Dr. Mark, I'm, I'm thinking about getting a hundred thousand dollar CAD CAM machine. So I'm going to spend 
two hundred bucks on on eBay to get a piece of junk camera. Why wouldn't you want the most gorgeous crystal clear image? Right. So the patient owns their problem. Right. With that, you stop doing pre denials. You stop wasting your time with the dental insurance company. Wait, wait, Mark. I don't know what a pre denial is. What is a pre denial? I would love for those on the call today to raise your hand or go in the chat if you file pre authorizations with our friends at the insurance industry. And I have people that get angry at me, Kirk, because they say, well, you have to. And I'm like, well, I didn't file any. Well, how do you practice like that? And you just take it off the menu. Kirk, would you role play that with me, please? Sure, let's do it. Kirk, you have a hole in your head. Would you like me to fix it in gold or white? Uh, the best possible solution. Okay, I we're going to do it in morning or afternoon. Which is better for you, sir? Right away. We can do that. Do you have any questions about how we, you can comfortably finance this? Uh, no, I'm, I'm, I don't. Do you have, uh, do you have somebody that can help Ask you? Ask me a question. Will you file? Oh, will you file? Will you file my insurance for me? Oh, we absolutely will file your insurance. But what we don't do here, since you didn't quite say it, <laughs> was file a pre-authorization. Right. Ask me that. Do you file a pre-authorization? Kirk, may I ask you a question, sir? Please. Six weeks from now, if the insurance doesn't pay for it, what are you going to do? Uh, you have a hole in your head. Well, it's a lot of money, Dr. Mark. That yes, sir. I respect that. Besides money, is there any reason that you wouldn't avoid a slow, painful root canal? Uh, is it going to hurt? Have I ever hurt you, sir? No. no or you, you could be really smart and say, it won't hurt me a bit. And that, that, That's not a great answer. It's sure no. fun to say it. It is. I say, Kirk, it sounds like discomfort is a concern for you. If I promised you yeah. the gentlest injection you ever had in your life or you don't have to pay, would you go ahead and fix the tooth? Absolutely. So you can guarantee that? I guarantee it'll be the gentlest injection you ever had in your life. Kirk, we use super topical, a mixture of lidocaine, prilocaine, and tetracaine. The patient's 99% numb before you even numb them. And then we buffered with one set. It's the one pharma's the company. Dr. McFalkel invented that. It's a dentist and chemist from California. The injections hurt because people are injecting ice cold lidocaine. It's the same pH, the same acidity as lemon juice, and it burns. So if you buffer, if you take Dr. Falkel's two-way mixing pan, you pull out some lidocaine, shoot in liquid sodium bicarb into your lidocaine cartridge, then do the injection. The pH, the acidity of the lidocaine has become 7.4. It's the same as water. So instead of lemon juice, you're injecting water slowly, gently, boom, the patient's numb in 90 seconds and you're dancing. It's called supper time. It's a great time to be a dentist. <laughs> I'm sorry, buddy. I'm not the best role player. I value you. You did great, man. You were I like, awesome. I like paying for it because I know it's a great investment. You know, yeah, it's just interesting. The, the reason, and when people say to me, well, well yeah, I, I filed pre authorize everybody. And I'm said, that's because you don't use your camera. I'm like, well, how do you know? I said, because if you showed people these pictures, they'd say, my tooth is cracked. You need to fix it. Yeah. It is the truest thing I've ever seen. I started working with cameras in 1991, Kirk. You had baby teeth back in 1991. I did. And the first intro camera I bought was $17,900. It was an old AccuCam on a big white wooden cart that you drag around from room to room. And I took pictures of patients' ears and noses and finally put it between their lips. Kirk, that afternoon I checked four patients that had been in my practice for five years with me saying, you need a crown, you need a filling, you need this done. And then saying, let me think about it. You must need a new car. Can we get a pre-denial? I took pictures on those four patients. I booked eight crowns that one afternoon. Kirk, what'd you think I did the next day? Probably did the same thing. I bought more cameras. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I practiced with a camera in every room the rest of my career. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, people say this and research indicates talking is the worst form of communication. We're a very digital society. I could describe a beautiful meal to you, but you're going to love it or appreciate it or understand it more if I can take you through in a visual tour of it. And I'll tell you my favorite pictures. People don't often look at other people on, inter on the internet. They're looking at their own photos of themselves and their own teeth. So if you show me a photo of me, it creates like twice the experience for me. So I agree. Talking to patients isn't the most effective. Showing and then asking and letting them talk. It's a great way to think about it. It's the truest thing. So you get the right team, you master communication skills, you educate yourself as a family. 
you invest in the technology, and then you deliver exquisite patient care, which comes from, again, going to Panky, going to Spear, going to Coyce, going to Dawson, joining Act University, and look, you got a million dollars of business advice for pennies if you're a practicing dentist. If you're a student, it's complimentary. It's absolutely nuts to not do that. Um, and for patient care, my, my hero and mentor in dentistry was Dr. Erwin Becker from Panky. And he looked at me one day and said, Mark, the reason most patients have to, haven't accepted optimal care dentistry is that no one ever offered it to them. Right. Now, let me, let me, be, let me have a little fun with this. Bring it on, baby. You and I live in this world. I completely agree with what you're saying because I've been and I know how powerful it is. But Mark, I don't have any money to do this. And I, why would I take those? I, I learned all that stuff in dental school. Tell me, a, tell me what you say to that. The beauty of Panky to me is philosophically, Panky tries to shrink the gap of what is taught and what is actually practiced. Right. So yes, you learned it, but you didn't integrate it yet. And the other thing about that is you've got to decide who you want to be as a professional, what type of team you want to have, and what level of care you're going to deliver. So if you buy that concept, the patient's always right, but they don't have to be your patient. It's okay to look at them and say, sir, madam, what you need is not what I do. And that is okay. It's yeah. okay to help them grow elsewhere, to find a practice that fits them better. Right. For me, I did tons of surgery early in my career. I did a two-year hospital residency. I used to take out impacted thirds. Actually, one of my favorite things to do in dentistry. But the character of the practice really changed. We did so much restorative stuff and cosmetic stuff, it didn't make sense when you have everything carpeted and nice wallpaper to do surgical extractions, particularly not in the, in the days of COVID. Right. Um, so you ha you for a young doc, you're gonna you're gonna sculpt your career consistently, constantly, and as you're gonna grow, you're gonna decide what you want to do. The I to Kirk, when I think one of the worst things to do is say I'm gonna try to do this molar root canal with 16 roots, all of them dilacerated because I need the money. That, that's a lousy way to practice. It's a way for an ulcer and high stress and not a lot of satisfaction. So yeah. now go back to the education piece because I completely agree again. And one of the X factors is, I mean, some of those people you meet are the most important people in your life. When you go to a course, you know, I just finished one with Dr. Mark Murphy. I remember going to the Panky Institute. We stayed at the condos and this is what he said to me, kid, this is the condo where you stay here. Unfortunately, you have to sleep on the couch. I'm like, oh, I get, to, but we laughed so hard that first night in the condo and all those relationships, they stick with you for years and years and years. So not only do you learn to be a better dentist, but you take the most important relationships with you as you grow. It makes, it makes the most sense, Kirk. You, it doesn't make sense for you to focus on lowest common denominator dentistry if you really want to shine, if you really want to soar to me. So you go to a place that pushes you and challenges you. Kirk, I know you played football in high school, I believe. Yes. Um, I, I was captain of the football team in ninth grade, 155 pound middle linebacker. It was not a pretty sight. Uh, we had a perfect record, 0 and 7. And I switched to soccer in high school. But you know what I found is when I took advanced placement, courses, I made A's. And when I hung out with my soccer buddies, who were some good men, a lot of them not very focused, I got B's in regular classes and A's in my honors class. Does that make sense? It makes perfect sense. I think you rise or fall to your competition. Saturday night, everybody mark your calendar, Carolina Duke basketball, last home game of the regular season. I'm dying. It's been a tough year for both schools. Yeah. But it's been a part of my life since I was nine years old and I'm all fired up. But it doesn't matter what type of season they're having. It's going to be a war. Right. And it now, brings it, out the best in them and as opposed to when you play someone that you know you're going to win, then you does. don't bring your A game. It does. A good mutual friend that you and I both share, Dr. Nito Cobain, yeah. High Point University, has told me this for years. Kirk, you become the average of the five people you hang around with most. You need to pick some better friends and some tougher friends on that. I'll That's why he told you to stay away from me. That's really sweet. I have to no, call he, him. he didn't include your name in the conversation. <laughs> yeah, I'm flattered. Pointing to. So how important is that to a dentist? It's the truest thing ever. And again, you know, why would you go hang out at Panky? Because you meet people like the chair of education, 
Dr. Right. Leanne Brady, one of the finest cosmetic dentists in the world. Amen. You meet magnificent people. When you go to Spear Education, you might get lucky and meet Frank Spear. You may meet Steve Radcliffe and Gary DeWood, both were my panky classmates. And I learned so much from them. You learn almost, if not more, in the evening when you have lunch or dinner with your buddies or when you're in the condos or at a hotel talking as you do when you're in class. So, you know, that your dental school education just gets started when you leave dental school. You've just learned the language and you've had a taste of all the different specialties maybe. And um, so that's just got to be a part of being a professional is I, I set a goal, Kirk, for me to do 100 hours of continuing education every year. So I got my fellowship with the Academy of General Dentistry, my mastership with the Academy of General Dentistry. I, I'm guessing, I don't even know anymore. I'm sure I'm way past 5,000 hours of continuing education because I realized I had a ton to learn and dentistry kept changing. Why would you say to me, I had a classmate of mine come up to me, one of the seminars I was giving, and he said, Mark, I'm doing it just the way they taught me in dental school. I'm like, back off, sailor. I'm not doing anything the way they taught me in dental school. The principles of quality don't change. But man, the material sure do. The, the philosophy changes. We People pine away, Kirk, for some mythical golden age of dentistry. Why would you want to practice without a CBCT, right. without a CERAC, without a DigiDoc control camera, without handheld x-ray like the XTG, without buffering like the onset, without an isolite? When you go down the list, you think that was a golden age of dentistry when you couldn't have, didn't have any of those technologies? What we can do with bone grafting and implanting and it, it's just crazy. It's, it's awesome. just, it's a joy to be a dentist and it's just getting better. So for the young men and women, you know, the theme that we tried to get for today was the future so bright, you got to wear shades. And that, that is true. You can join the small group of poopy people that are saying the profession's ruined and corporations are ruining everything and the economy, COVID's ruined everything. My mentor in Greensboro, Kirk, who I want you to have on sometime, confided in me last year was the biggest year he ever had. And that was with taking a couple months off for COVID. He still had his career year. So there are men and women in dentistry that are knocking it out of the park because they're paying attention to the five principles of getting the right team and the right levels of communication and the right education, investing in technology wisely, and then mastering the patient care. You do that, you win, I promise you. Yeah, I look at this as, I don't care if you're layering porcelain, layering confidence, you get that first layer in, you get the second layer, third layer. Now you're off and running and you look at your office when you park your car and walk towards you go like this, this is fun. This is more fun. And, and more than anything, Mark, I know you have a special place in your heart for these young dentists and dentists more than anything, but this is an incredibly noble profession. And the one most important thing I think is you've got to make sure that you look at the future and you see it as promising. It's like a future poll and you got to have the right people around you. But if I'm watching this today and I'm a dentist and I'm 32, 35, Mark, what do you want to tell me about the next three decades of practice? Sum this up for me. Sum it up. I would say you were so lucky. Would I like to be back in dental school? <clears throat> that would be no. Would I like to have my career where I could still be with these patients that I had adored with my teammates who I loved and cherished and making a difference in people's lives? I miss the hands-on dentistry big time. I love teaching at the dental school. It, it has been a real treat and a joy for me, unanticipated. Um, so what would I say to these young folks looking forward to three decades of dentistry is you can't imagine how sweet it can be. There's going to be some bitter, but most of it's going to be sweet. The Dale Carnegie Organization says three magic words, evidence defeats doubt. So you use the technology to put the changes that are going on in people's mouths in front of them. And you take the time to listen and ask and see what their goals are for their health, teeth, and smile and give it to them. It's really a formula for success. And everybody can do it. I don't care where you live. I don't care where you went to school. I don't care what color, size, shape, sexuality, religion you are. There's not a man or woman or person on this call that can't be part of something special. And you just have to make that decision. Tom Peters, one of my heroes, Kirk, I got to meet him twice wrote the book In Search of Excellence, A Passion for Excellence, and actually wrote a book about my dental practice, Thriving on Chaos. 
And uh, Tom, paraphrasing, said, you can achieve excellence today and forever, but as of right now, stop doing non-excellent work. So you just make the decision right here, right now, that this is what I'm standing for. And um, for people who haven't done that yet, it's not too late, but it is later than you think. So have at it, start simple. You don't have to start with a $100,000 purchase of a CAD CAM machine or a CBCT. The top camera in dentistry costs you 20 bucks a day for a year. You spend that on a couple cups of Starbucks and a pack of chewing gum. Mm -hmm. And this is something that can easily add a million dollars to your practice in five to 10 years. Amen, brother. Amen. I always enjoy our conversation. I did. Joy to see you, sir. Well, every time I'm with you, I get something like you. And the new one today was the Dale Carnegie evidence defeats. Say that again. Evidence defeats doubt. Love that. Dude. Evidence defeats doubt. People have no clue what's going on in their mouth. So give them the privilege of the opportunity to say yes to optimal care. It's awesome. Buddy. It's a fun way to work. I promise you. That is awesome. We had a, we had a comment in the thread. I, I failed to say you're killing me smalls. And I, so I had to say that I just missed the chance. I can't see who put that comment in there, but that, that slips into a seminar now, now and then. Uh, Kirk, I love what you're doing. I've said this a thousand times. When dentistry panicked a year ago and everybody froze, Kurt Barrett acted. And you called me and said, well, I, don't know, blah, 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 blah. I don't know what we're going to do. We're going to do this two-day uh, COVID relief conference on a Thursday and a Friday. Will you help? I'm like, sure. Then so well, it's going to be Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. I'm like, okay, I'm in. And then Friday evening, you said, will you be our kickoff speaker Monday? I'm like, I thought we were done. Sure, I'll do one more, which became, what, the next four months or whatever. Uh, and um, Every Monday you were there. It was a joy. That. It was an absolute joy to see the family and to re-meet old friends and meet young superstars that I would have never had the chance to meet. You think about the people that you helped discover, Kirk. For dentistry, you think about Kevin Groth, young star from Michigan, Dr. Kelly Tanner from Virginia. I'm just thinking going down the list of people that I'd never heard. Bill Robbins, I loved. I'd never heard him speak. Yeah. You know, I'd met him from the seminar world. Um, getting to hear Uchi was a joy. Dr. Saversky, when we could keep his pants on. You know, it just was a it was a real, it was a real special thing that you all created. Bob Margis, I'd I knew of Bob, I'd never gotten to know him. Darren Becker from Atlanta. So you you really lit the fire for people. You saved a lot of careers and you just put millions of dollars of continuing education into people's hands for, as a love gift, Kirk. And so I'll, I'll never, dentistry will never forget what you did. I'm really proud of you, sir. Well, thank you, brother. And uh, we were all in this together. I needed you guys as much as anybody and a positive distraction and uh you know education brought us together that's how you and i met that's how we met uchi that's how i met bill and i i just feel like it's the thing that'll always get us together and bring us through is education that's why i love this stuff so much so buddy you're just a huge part of this now i know you're heading down to hidman and the the lecture circuit is starting to pick up again and so i'm just going to say this if you guys haven't seen mark speak you gotta see him so if you're going to hidman this is a non-negotiable. You got to see this man do his thing. I've been in the room many times. It's electrifying, outrageously funny, and you will enjoy every minute of it. And then also, if you got a study club, this, this is a guy that you got to have just to keep you fired up. And I know you do a lot of webinars for just anybody, you know, great companies. You do them for the schools. If somebody's watching or listening, how do I get a hold of you? What do I do? How do I find out more about Dr. Mark? Yeah, my speaking website is Dr. Mark Speaks, D R M A R K S P E A K S. If I can help anybody with anything, if you need the contact for any of these manufacturers, if you need more information on any of these institutions or institutes, if you just need a shoulder, I am pleased to talk to anybody if I can help you in any fashion. Again, I'm so thrilled that you joined us today and that you listened to me. I, I met Kirk, it was, I'm pretty certain it was at the Florida dental meeting in Orlando at the Gaylord Palms. Is that right, Kirk? That is correct. I don't know how you remember that. I just, cause I was having a pleasant lunch with Keith Phillips and this really bizarre young man with no hair came up and was talking and throwing his arms around. And 
I thought, oh God, I'll never see him again. And I just now it's like a bad check. I can't get rid of you. But what a wonderful thing. Kirk, I'm just so proud of you, bud. And marvel and master and appreciate and admire your success and your contribution to dentistry. As a non-dentist, you've changed the profession. So God bless you, bud. Well, thank you, brother. And and you still got a lot to give too. I feel like we're all just getting started here. So, and and if you're watching or listening to this, you're just getting started too. And as you've already seen and heard, the future is so bright. You're going to have to wear shades. So uh, my, my hope is you enjoy it and uh, do what Mark's talking about. It works. It is truly the way to create a great practice. So Mark, stick around while we say goodbye to everybody we'll else. Thank you guys for listening and tuning in. Uh, if you enjoyed today, which I know you did, just do us a favor, hit the share button, share this with your friends. Keep sending us suggestions. Don't miss the Duke, uh, uh, North Carolina game. Uh, Talk Heels, baby. Saturday? Is it Saturday night? Saturday night, 6 p.m. ESPN. Go Heels. Oh, and you know what's so exciting? We got Super Bowl over now. I, I, I'm always reminded this is like the toughest time of year for sports between the the Super Bowl and when March Madness, but March Madness is right around the corner. I cannot yes. wait. I need it. A couple weeks away. Amen. It's going to be different, but going to be great. It is. It is. So until we see you guys next time, keep watching the best practices show. You guys enjoy you. the rest of your day. Thank you.